everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be tackling the topic of author photos. This was actually suggested in a comment on a video, so thank you to Shante for asking me to tackle this and specifically asking, do you need one? If you need one, do you need it before your book deal announcement or later? And can you take your own? So I'm going to cover those three specific questions and go so much further because it wouldn't be an Alexa Dunn video if I didn't go a little bit overboard. And to that end, we're gonna have some wardrobe changes in this video, mostly because I can already tell that my battery is running low and I'm gonna have to charge it. Also, cause I have a lot to cover and I want to show you examples of what I would wear to a photo shoot cause that is one of the things I'm going to cover, what you should wear. And it is gonna differ person to person, but to give you the example, I love green. I love how I look in green. I like how it reflects off of my skin. I like the makeup I compare with it and how it works with my hair. Green and red go together. So this is one example of something I might wear for an author photo. Now, I have never had professional photos taken, which we are going to talk about. I have done DIY, which is why I have many, many bits of advice for you if you also go the DIY route. But I did ask both some authors who have had professional photos taken as well as friends who are photographers, professional photographers, for some of their tips and tricks. But meaning to say, I don't know if a professional photographer would okay this color, though they tend to say wear something that you're comfortable in and I believe you're not supposed to wear white specifically, which is fine because I don't like wearing white. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start at the very top. Do you need an author photo? And the answer is yes in very rare circumstances, depending on the genre, like where you're being published, your publisher, and your personal situation, you may have a publisher who allows you to use either not your own photo, that can happen when you're like trying to protect your identity, it happens sometimes, or an illustration. I know some people are incredibly photo shy for very good reasons, but by and large, I've seen even authors who I know definitely have social anxiety about having their photo taken and other things do end up needing to have a professional author photo. There are workarounds. You can always do the kind of having a photographer you trust like really capture you from the side or you're looking down like so that you can feel a bit more comfortable with your image. But by and large, yes, you are going to need to have an author photo. The second question is, do you need one before your book deal announcement or can you have one later? So you do need an author photo for your book deal announcement, at least in Publishers Weekly, they put your photo there. Your photo doesn't end up going on Publishers Marketplace. But the thing is, for your book deal announcement, it doesn't have to be a professional photo. You can pick the best photo that you have of yourself where you like the way you look and feel that you are pretty authorly. This is actually a place where you can totally submit a DIY photo. Just for your own sake, my advice is like, make sure you like the photo that you submit because it's going to be on your announcement digitally forever. And like when you snip it and you put it as your pinned tweet, like that is the photo that you use. But you do not need a professional author photo for your book deal announcement. But when it comes to your book jacket, this is the later. It's going to vary publisher by publisher, but like, six months before your book is published, they're going to ask you for the author photo for your book jacket, sometimes earlier. And that is when you're going to need your professional author headshot. Asterisk, as I said, I have done DIY for my author photos. The first time, cause well, I needed an author photo for my book deal announcement. I had a friend take it and I was perfectly happy with it. So we did use it for my book jacket. The second time, because of the pandemic, the panini, I was unable to get a professional author headshot. I actually really wanted to go get one. I finally feel like less gun shy. It is totally okay to feel really, really nervous about going to a professional photographer for your author headshot, by the way. But because of the pandemic and timing, I had to do another DIY shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so far, both of my author photos have been photos that one a friend took and the second one I took right here. I mean, if you see my author photo, you can tell. Sitting in front of this bookcase filming a video, I basically took a screenshot and that is my author photo, which is not super ideal. Screenshots are going to be lower resolution, but needs must. So my advice for authors is ask your editor when they think they're going to need your author photo for the book jacket and then schedule a photo shoot, a professional photo shoot, if that is the option that you're going for, I'd say at least two months before it is due. 
not because it takes like a really long time to get your photo, but like as a just in case so that you know that you have it, so you know that you're happy with it. In a worst case scenario, maybe you need to take another one. I, I just like the peace of mind of doing something really, really early. Or I've definitely seen people who do get that pro headshot taken before the book deal announcement. It's going to depend on how much time you have. I had about a week or two to prepare so I had a friend take a photo. But other people, it's a, lo a much longer gap between the offer and having their book deal announcement. And it's actually like a fun game some of us play. Like when we see someone update their photo on Twitter and it's very clearly a professional headshot, we'll go, ooh, they probably sold their book. It can actually be a pretty good hint that that is what has happened to someone. So it is totally up to you, but can you take your own photo is the third question. And yes, obviously you can. I talked about DIY. And I have a ton of tips and advice for DIY that I'm going to go into pretty in depth because I have done it before. Also because a lot of people are nervous or don't have the budget to pay for a professional photographer. And there are many ways to get a good DIY shot. But that said, overall, I really do recommend that you get a professional to take your author photos because nine times out of 10, it's just going to turn out better. You're going to look a little more polished, a little more professional in that author shot. You should really only do it if you're absolutely strapped for cash. You cannot like anxiety wise face going to professional photographer and you know you have someone in your life who you know takes good portrait photos. That is really, really important. The average person doesn't actually know how to take good portrait photography. That leads me into my DIY photography tips. And by the way, as always, this is timestamp, so you can jump down to the tips about going to a professional shoot. But honestly, a lot of this kind of blurs together. Some of the tips for DIY are going to apply for if you're hiring a professional and vice versa, because in the professional section, I'm gonna talk about makeup and what you wear and so on. So the number one thing is, Use a professional camera if at all possible, like not your phone and not even necessarily a point and shoot. Though that said, asterisk, this is just full of asterisks. Again, phone cameras have of course come a really, really long way. A lot of them now have a portrait function. They didn't used to have that. So a really fancy iPhone or Android with portrait fu function is pr better than a point and shoot for sure, like a standalone point and shoot. But whenever possible, if you have a DSLR or access to one, this is where it's like, d d everyone has a friend who has a photography habit, right? One <laughs> hopes. Ask around if you can. The photos just inevitably turn out better the better camera you use. They have better lenses, they have better like light meters, a lot of them have portrait settings as well. And the bonus there is if you know someone who has a nice camera, the question is can they take your photos for you? And then as a nice thing I would suggest like buy them coffee or a gift card or something if they are taking your author photos because they're probably doing it for free. And if you are say a YouTuber <laughs> like I am and you have one of these cameras and you are comfortable in front of the camera, you can do what I did, which is I sat in front of my space, I basically filmed and I used a screenshot. That is because I know that there are ways to like set up your camera so that you can take your own pictures, but I, the thing is I want to do a lot of different poses quickly and I just am actually not confident enough getting it to do that as photo, so I did it as a screenshot. So if you are really savvy, you can do that whole setting up the timer and taking a bunch of shots, but I personally felt most comfortable doing it that way. Which brings me to please, please, 99.9% .9 of the time, do not use a selfie. Selfies in general, they're distorted because you're using the other side of the camera. So, I mean, maybe you like that that's not technically what you look like, but the images almost always end up looking slightly distorted. And to that end, you can tell, I can usually tell, when an author has used a selfie as an author photo and it, it looks more amateurish. Plus, you're taking them like this, that's vertically. And generally with author photos, you want to have a horizontal option and a vertical option. You want to think about all the different ways that people may need to crop your author photo. You want to have an interesting background and kind of enough negative space to lead to a variety of options. Also, that sometimes you can see the arm. Like you can basically, your shoulder gets raised when you have to take a selfie. It's just really difficult to get 
a selfie that looks good and professional. That said, I have seen authors accomplish it, and even though I can tell it's a selfie, I'm impressed with what they've done. So never say never, but generally speaking, I don't advise you use a selfie for your author photo. I also, this is the personal opinion in terms of like taking a photo on your phone slash doing a selfie for your photo. Don't facetune the heck out of your author photos. We are gonna talk about photoshopping your professional photos. There should always be a little bit of fine tuning to a professional photo. So I guess that would include a selfie or a photo that you take on your phone, but don't go overboard. Your author photo should look like you and I just don't advise doing like enlarging your eyes and like slimming your face. I mean, you do you if that's what you want to do, but I personally think your author photo should reasonably look like you look. You should look happy and confident and like your photo, but We've all had that phenomenon, or I've had it at least once or twice, where you meet an author in person and you're like, your author photo was heavily facetuned. <laughs> and it's a weird feeling. It's a weird, weird feeling. Now, the next thing for DIY, though this will factor into getting a pro shot, because this there are different kinds of photographers who do different kinds of things. Backgrounds. You want to find a visually interesting background, but something that isn't too busy. So honestly, I'll say my bookcase background was not ideal for my author photos. I was kind of stuck with a DIY and I did in Photoshop blur the background to try to make it look a little bit nicer. But like there are ones that you see in a lot of author photos. The classic is like against a brick wall. That's a really good one. Like a wall with interesting texture where it's not dirty. Um, people will pose in front of plants. Uh, my first author DIY author photo actually I found of it was basically like an ivy wall like so the background was basically ivy it was like nature and like all one color but a little bit of interesting texture you can technically take a picture against something like a white wall but that's almost a little too boring but it does work in a pinch but if you're going to a professional photographer or I mean I guess if you want to be really ambitious with your DIY and like buy a kit you can buy basically backdrops that have like soothing colors and sometimes they'll use back spotlights to like create that halo effect like you can technically do all that stuff DIY and when it comes to choosing your photographer you can choose between natural photography lighting and uh, usually backgrounds because you're going to a physical place outside versus studio where it looks like more of that backdrop. My opinion with DIY is whenever possible, try to take your DIY author photos outside. This is because, well, depending on the time of day, because we are going to talk about lighting. Well, it's because it is way easier to get a decently lit, good looking photo outside as long as the writing is light against an interesting background than say somewhere in your house. That's why my second DIY author photo IMO is really not ideal because I only had so many places in my apartment where I felt I could take a decent author photo and I went with this. So that doesn't mean that you, if you also have an interesting bookshelf, maybe less busy than mine, you could do that as well. But I find DIY usually turns out the best when you go outside for your photo shoot. Which brings me to lighting, which is the number one thing. Bad lighting ruins a photo so, so easily. And what I'm actually going to do is I will link down below to some cool videos that I watched back when I was doing all of my research for DIY, plus some blog posts I found that show the difference between like a good headshot and a bad headshot. And so much of the time you will notice lighting. <laughs> lighting is the thing that ruins images. What happens very, very often, you either get the kind of bad lighting where it like casts harsh shadows onto someone's face and they just don't look their best. There's also the kind of lighting where they look sallow, where someone will look like they have jaundice. I have seen that a lot. And I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of author photos through like author mentor match and whatnot. And look, I'm shading DIY and telling you to get your lighting in order, but I have seen professional photos where I thought the lighting was bad. So I guess that comes down to really research the professionals who you go to for your author headshots. But like, yeah, bad shading or shadows on someone's face that isn't flattering being washed out, looking jaundiced. There's all sorts of stuff that can go wrong with lighting and there's only so much you can fix in Photoshop with poor lighting. It's best to start with good lighting at the outset. So if you have to take your photos inside, if that is what you are going for, it's really, really important. You want to face 
a window, a decent sized window. It shouldn't be like a weird small one that's gonna cast weird shadows on your face. So I am filming in my apartment. Another reason I chose this for my DIY spot, there is a giant window right there. <laughs> I always use that as a natural lighting to backlight my videos. I also have a window over here, which helps here, and sometimes I have to adjust the blinds if it's off balance. And then I have a soft kit. So if you want to be intense with your DIY, you can buy a lighting kit. Maybe don't do that if you're not also a YouTuber who's going to use it, but I have a light lighting kit, a soft kit on right now, which helps. So all the light is coming this way toward my face is the point, and the camera is right there. So you can see my features, like you can see my face. I'm not too washed out, but like, honestly, what is me, at least I, I'm looking at the viewfinder. I hope I look nice. Uh, I think I got the lighting right. I, it's, it's been trial and error with YouTube over the years. People are always complimenting me on my skin, Part of that is skincare, part of that is makeup, and part of that is lighting. Actually, also clothing. Uh, this color on me refracts light. <laughs> know your colors. Uh, and, and, and complements my skin tone. I have a pink undertone and I know what colors go well with that. Uh, but a lot of this is the, is the lighting and how my skin is reflecting and how you're getting kind of softness and brightness and tone. So yeah, if you're inside, Window is in front of you with the camera facing this way. The light is all coming toward you. Same thing if you're outside, by the way. You want to make sure the light is behind you, not in front of you. So meaning the light is behind the camera in front of you. You never want it to be where like the sun is, is here. <laughs> the sun is behind you and the camera is coming this way. You're gonna look washed out and weird. Sun needs to be behind the photographer. But the time of day that you take your photo also really, really matters. I happen to know this is one of the best times of the day to film because I'm really accustomed to it with YouTube. Um, but I actually would not take professional photos outside at this time of the day. It's about 1 p.m. in September. If it were summer, be a little bit different because yeah, time of the year also affects how the lighting works. But the ideal time to take your author photos outside is what's called like golden hour or magic hour. It's one to two hours after sunrise and one to two hours before sunset. I usually go for the one before sunset because I am not up that early, but this is called golden hour for a reason. It is an ideal time when like basically the sun isn't too high in the sky and you're gonna get nice kind of diffused natural light. But again, this is also why try to find a friend who is good at photography and kind of knows what they're doing because hopefully part of that being good at photography, like look at their photos, look at their Instagram feed. Like, are they the friend who t takes photos of, of the group and friends most of the time? How do they like people? Do they seem to have a sense of making people look really good? That's the friend you go with. So my next tip is about like posing and positioning. And this is again about having someone else take a photo of you or if you are setting up your own shot, do not let someone take a photo of you from below. You're gonna look bad. Very few people look good from that angle, but especially, this is my sidebar, for people of size like myself. You might already know this. Do not let people take pictures of you from below because then you, oh God, I don't want to see it. You look. It's not good. If you have any concerns about your chin, positioning can be really hard. The weird thing that's hard to accept is the ideal angle for this sometimes is actually straight on. You need to know your angles. So this can mean do a ton of practice yourself to know how you like to be photographed. So when I had my friend do my DIY, I had her stand on a bench. I knew what angle I wanted and it had to be really really careful so that like I felt like I had the most flattering angle but I wasn't doing that dreaded we've all seen these where like it's like this like the the cameras like where you're like looking straight up at the camera that's always a little too try hard we see it in selfies sometimes too don't make it so extreme that you're like so obviously trying to like slim yourself there's a fine line so if it's a friend taking your photo have them stand on something or get a tall friend <laughs> but generally speaking no matter what your size is but but if you are of size or concerned about kind of the angles of your face like all people look slightly more flattering in photos if they're taken with at least a slight upward, like down angle. To that end, again, 
practice. It seems like strange like when you hear about like a vain celebrity or some something who has a favorite side of their face, but the thing is I found through YouTube I actually do have a favorite side of my face. Take lots of test photos, see what you like, have your friend take them, look at them after they've taken photos, and figure out what you like. This can also go into different things like whether you're gonna smile wide or do the smile. Um, generally speaking, I find most authors do not do like wide smiles in their photos. It's also going to depend on your genre, but like practice, figure out your angles, what you like, and go from there. Which actually brings me to body posing. I did a ton of research on this on YouTube. So again, I'm going to link to some of the videos that I watch, but the quick ones that I remember, because this was years ago, is to stick your chin out slightly. It's, it's this really fine line though. You don't want to lose your neck, <laughs> but you don't want to be really tight to your chest. It's like this subtle jutting of your chin just to like give yourself a little bit of dimension. Now professional photographers are going to know this and will hopefully coach you with this, but if you're doing DIY, you have to figure out how to pose yourself. The other tip that I saw was about arm position. They called it holding a sub. So imagine you're holding like a giant sub sandwich. So hold your hands out like this, they're out of the frame, and it positions and settles your shoulders nicely. <laughs> That's like a nice tip. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, I don't always remember to use it and then my shoulders tense up but that's it's you're holding a, you're holding a sandwich and you're sticking your chin out the other thing is smizing which is real it's like funny to think about oh Tyra talks about smizing but it's legit again practice try different photos you can practice with selfies or like take I, I practice screenshots all the time because I do YouTube the difference between <laughs> trying to get my eyes like wide and startled well, but even just like normal and you just like, you, you think about closing your eyes like slightly. The other thing you can do is like to refresh your eyes and make them fresh is I'll do like, I'll look down and then look up. Those are all things that apparently models do. So like, I'm going to link you to things that I find useful as tips of like how to like just get your posing and like get a little more natural. And generally when you're taking the photos, try lots of little things. It's little movements that do it. So let's say you're starting here. You want to do slight. You want to move. Like maybe I'm moving a little too much here and demonstrating, but it's, it's like tiny little movements because you never know what that like perfect shot with the angle and like whether you look happy and fresh, your eyes connecting to the lens, that's really, really, really important. That's another one I've seen, like I've seen author photos where I'm like, ooh, they're just really not connecting with the lens or I can tell that they're nervous. The photographer didn't put them at ease. Again, I've seen this with professional shots. Um, it's like the ideal author headshot, in my opinion. You're connecting with the camera with your eyes. You look happy, relaxed, confident, and, and there's that connection piece with beautiful lighting and so on and good body positioning. It's it's like, it's, it's magic. So the next DIY tip is edit your photos. My friend who is a photographer like yelled this at me and was like, tell them to edit their photos. Very, very important because this is the step that all professionals do. They do basically light retouching. If you don't have those skills yourself, find someone who does. Like maybe it's someone on Fiverr. Maybe it's that friend who took your photos. Maybe they're good at it. I personally have slight Photoshop skills. I did my own. The first DIY sets like you adjust the lighting. As I said, there's only so much you can do in Photoshop, but you can do things in Photoshop. There's like balancing that you can do. And then there's all sorts of tricks with your face. Don't want to go overboard, but there are things you can do to like blemishes and like evening things and brightening things. The tiny, tiny bit of retouching and editing goes a long way to bumping those photos up to making them look more professional. A great way to bridge the gap between DIY and professional. And my friend said specifically, pay attention to contrast, brightness and exposure, vibrancy of colors and sharpness. As I already said, you want to make sure you have a variety of photos in the sense of you want to have a horizontal photo and a vertical photo, ideally, that you can pick one that is like your favorite and is your main photo. But always bear in mind how it might be cropped into a square or a circle because those are so common now in graphic design and social media. But also make sure it can play horizontally or vertically on different, like in different media and on different websites. 
as I said, there's other stuff that's going to apply to DIY. I am going to talk about makeup and hair and your clothes in the professional photographer section. I'm going to start with how to find a professional photographer, like some tips and tricks, because my next author photo, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But first, we're going to charge the battery and do an outfit change. Magic. So now we are going to talk about finding a professional photographer to take your author headshots, all the tips and tricks that I have. The first thing that you need to know, and my professional photographer friend told me this one, is that there is a difference between a natural light photographer and a studio photographer. This plays into that whole background thing where you need to know what you want because of course there's going to be a difference between a natural light shot outside in front of say a brick wall and a studio lit shot shot in a studio with a studio background. It totally depends on your personal preference, your genre, what you like, and definitely shop around for different photographers. It helps to know which one you want, or you can figure out which one you want by going to different options, op different photographer websites, look through their portfolio, look what they, at what they shoot, look at their FAQs. They'll usually say, it's shot in my studio with studio lighting or natural lighting. That's the trick. Some photographers do natural lighting in a studio. It varies and basically figure out what you prefer. Generally, that is a key. When you're looking at professional photographers who you want to take your headshot, don't just go with the first one you find or even necessarily one that was referred to you unless they were referred to you by a friend where you said, I like your headshots who shot them. Because you want to be sure that you are happy with the final product. And so it's good to start with, I like that style. The next thing is to go in aware of how much generally it is going to cost you to get professional author headshots. It does vary both in terms of the kind of photographer but also the market. If you're not in, say, the big city, generally, yeah, it is probably going to be cheaper to get your author headshots. But the other flip side of that is when you're in smaller markets, you're more in the suburbs or out in the country or just not as large cities, you're gonna have less choice of photographers usually as well or types of photographers. Of course, I live in sunny, ridiculous California, which has a whole industry behind it. So 99.9% .9 of the photographers who you find all do headshots for actors, which is a little different usually from what you want for author headshots, though it depends. That said, again, the tip my photographer friend gave me was, generally speaking, the more you spend, the better your photos are likely to turn out because pricier photographers have both more experience and are more likely to have higher end equipment. And higher end equipment usually means better photos. But that said, I know that is really, really stressful because you're going, you're telling me I have to spend 600, 700, 800 dollars on author headshots. I can't afford that. Totally get it. So what is the range? I've seen on the low end, I mean, I've seen some options in Los Angeles for what are called express headshots for like $100, $150. Those are usually going to be one look and it's basically you get 30 minutes with a photographer. But they actually tend to recommend express headshots that kind of set up for experienced people who know how to take headshots, who won't get kind of frazzled by the limited time frame and just need some quick shots. You might also find that of course newer photographers, people who are trying to build up their portfolio are going to be cheaper and sometimes it can be a good option to go with someone in that situation because you can get a good deal and you're both helping each other out but just be careful with that you really want to do your research maybe do that when it's a referral situation like a friend of a friend because well like I said not all photographers are created equal definitely look at whatever portfolio they have make sure you trust them and are comfortable look for studios that are established that have lots of reviews if you're in a market like los angeles of course there are going to be photography studios and photographers who are have literally been in magazines so you know they are legit i just see that at least as someone who's in la you might have this issue in new york as well there are scammers out there in markets like this in your average place there probably aren't a lot of photography scams going on, but I have like heard the warnings in LA. Be careful of just like anyone who's like, I'll shoot cheap headshots. It could be something sketchy. So really, I would say the range that you want to look at and budget for on the low end, make sure you have at least like 150 to 
$300 to find a photographer who's going to be decent, gives you one to two looks, a decent amount of shots. Usually at a price like that, you're only going to get one to two shots that are fully retouched, but many of them will give you unlimited access to all the other digital shots that they took. And also what factors into that that you need to think about budgeting for is hair and makeup. I have a lot of thoughts about both of those that I will go into more detail about, but like just generally here in the budget conversation, don't forget to budget for that. So in the more mid to high range, look to spend 250 to like six to seven hundred dollars. When you go in the higher end, of course, you'll get more looks, you might get more images retouched, or those packages might include the hair and makeup. So it's actually nice that they're all bundled together, you're getting a deal. I mentioned the word package, so when you are going on photographer websites, I always like to look at that section. Many of them, they know that people are looking for that information quickly. How much does it cost? What do you get with it? Looks. So what is a look? A look is an outfit. <laughs> Outfit changes, well in acting spheres, looks can be not just an outfit change, but you're changing props, like you're changing the look and feel of the photo. For authors, we have to worry a little less about that, we're not doing character shots, but it's an outfit change and also sometimes, but not always, you do have to check what they allow for, sometimes also a hair and makeup change. Anytime you have a change in a look, there's going to be more time. Essentially, you're always booking a photographer's time. I have seen some photographers who do charge in terms of time, like you get me for an hour for this cost. Like I said, you see that with the Express Headshots uh, pricing, but most often what I have seen is packages where it's like one to two looks is this price and then three to four looks is this price. And you can look and see what they offer and figure out what works best for you. I mentioned hair and makeup is often worked into these packages, sometimes not always. Generally speaking, you're always free to get your own hair and makeup person or do it yourself. Most photography studios are flexible, but it does vary. And overall, the next question that naturally leads to is, do you have to pay for hair and makeup when you get your headshots done? You never have to, but it is recommended. Professionals will know what kind of makeup is going to read best on camera. They'll have a full kit so that you don't have to worry about buying expensive makeup, let alone knowing how to apply it. A hair person will like make sure your hair looks all smooth and you don't have flyaways and it'll look like just a lot more sleek in your final photo. And actually, if you end up going the DIY route, but you have a little bit of funds, you could splurge for getting your hair and makeup done. It could just be you go to Sephora and pay for the makeover, or you go to the salon and you get a blowout. Like, get your hair professionally done so you feel fully confident before your shoot, no matter what kind you do. If you do pay for hair and makeup for a professional shoot, they are actually there on site with you, which is nice. They're going to touch you up so that you're not shiny if you get sweaty. They'll, they'll fix your hair if you have a flyaway. And as I said, in some cases, if the package allows for it or you're paying for it, you could have multiple looks where you could even change your hair and makeup between shots. I'd say the sweet spot is you want to go for a package for a photographer who's going to let you do one to two looks. And the smartest thing to do is do your hair and your makeup so that it can go with those basically outfit changes. The looks are outfit changes. So I started in a green dress and I'm here in this red dress. This is an example of two outfits I would probably bring for looks. Though sometimes you want to bring more options and the photographer will tell you what's going to work best. As I mentioned before, I have no clue if they would like my green dress or this red dress. I do have some other options and maybe I'll show you some outfit change magic later. Walking back to more practical tips for actually finding these photographers. So you can start with referrals. If you're friends with people who have had headshots taken, whether they're in the business or they are fellow authors and you know that they're local to you, you can just ask people, oh, where did you get your headshot? Get referrals from people. What's really nice about this is that you can ask someone that you know who end results you know you like, what was the experience like? Because picking a photographer isn't just, oh, I like the photos they take, though that helps. It's making sure that you're going to feel comfortable with the experience of going with that photographer. And that is partly the scary part. I'll tell you, that is why I hesitated to do professional shots earlier on. Even now I'm still kind of nervous, but a huge part of that for me personally is I'm 
I've gotten kind of comfortable in front of the camera here on YouTube, but I am not the most comfortable in front of the camera in terms of taking still photos. I have a lot of hangups that have carried through with me through childhood, young adulthood to now. A lot of those hangups have to do with my body, with some of my angles, with, you know, we all have our personal hangups, which is why I did all that research, like about how to pose. And that kind of stuff really has helped me. And that's why I recommend that to build your confidence in like what you're supposed to do. But also finding a professional photographer where you can ask someone basically what their bedside manner is. What are they like on the shoot? Are they encouraging? Did they make you feel relaxed and comfortable? What were the kind of tips and tricks that they employed to get you to be comfortable on camera and get great shots? Experienced photographers know what to do. They know how to relax you and get you feeling natural. And sometimes you get the best, like almost candid shots where you just look natural and you're laughing and you're looking off to the side or whatever it is. A good photographer can get that that magic shot. A bad photographer snaps at you, yells at you, makes you feel uncomfortable, you look stiff on camera, you never relax. And so that's why with referrals you ask them what it was like and otherwise look up reviews for those photographers to find out the experiences people had. So actually finding them, that's referral. You ask around. Google. <laughs> I've done so much Googling. So if you are in a major metropolitan area as I am, it is actually pretty easy because you can Google headshot photographer of Los Angeles and you will come up with 800 million of them. Always bear in mind the Google game, uh, which studios may have paid for SEO or just really good at SEO. Like yes, ones on top are often really major ones, but I do advise going a couple, a bit deep into the search results and really looking around. Don't just land on the first one and go with it. Also, cause often the top ones are more famous, more expensive, they have less availability. They cost more. That's the Google side, very kind of top line basic. The other trick, especially if you are in a less major market, so you don't have 8 million photographers who offer headshots for actors and professionals, you can look for wedding and family photographers, engagement shoots, you can, those, you can use those search terms and basically see if they also would do something like this. Engagement shoots I find are really, really helpful if you find someone who does a lot of those because they're most often done outside in natural light, if that's what you want, but you can see how they photograph normal people who are supposed to look happy and relaxed in those photos. If they're really awkward or you don't like the lighting or the framing, that's not a good fit for you, but it can be a great way to find a photographer who might be able to take your author headshots. It's the same idea. You're just not in a couple holding hands and doing all that kind of stuff. Another tip can be to look for corporate photography. So like searching for it, let's say you're in Columbus, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, corporate photography or wedding photography, whatever you're looking for, but with corporate. Now, the downside is a lot of corporate photography, of course, can look really, really stiff. This is always, almost always going to be studio photography. So bear that in mind. But if you just want like a basic professional shot where you've got a nice looking background and you're all polished and you just smile and turn for the camera, a lot of basic corporate photography can turn out a really nice shot. You also might find, I've seen a lot of this, a lot of companies are taking much cuter, hipper photos for their corporate photos, and maybe you can find one of those photographers. So it's a little less like taking your school photo in front of the marble background. <laughs> So another tip, this one is a little bit harder. It can basically be, you can find great photographers on Instagram. Generally speaking, after you do the Google foo and you're on their website, look at their Instagram. There's of course gonna be a portfolio on their website or there should be, but I love looking at the photographer's Instagram to get a better sense of their style and kind of their ethos. It's a little harder to search Instagram in my experience, but I have found some people that way where I've tried random search terms and hashtags, it's kind of harder, but it could be another way to find people. Next, I want to offer some just tips slash wisdom for people of size, such as myself, or if you are a person of color. I think it's really, really important when you're going through photographers' websites and you're looking through their portfolio, if they have an Instagram feed, to make sure that they have shot and successfully shot people who look like you. For people of size, if you are a fat person, uh, have they ever photographed uh, people who are larger than model size? How do they, if so, how do they photograph them? Do you like the way those people look? 
Do they look natural and happy? Are the photos taken from flattering angles? And so on. If you see zero people who are not models, I admit this is more of a problem in Los Angeles, but I personally am not comfortable going to a photographer who has never shot a fat person because then I have no idea if they actually understand A, my hangups and B, kind of how to shoot my body. That is me personally. And then for people of color, I mentioned lighting and not all photographers are created equal, especially if you're going more on the amateur side, like let's say you are kind of trying to find photographers in a, in a more off the beaten path area and you're going by like engagement shoots or wedding photography, make sure they have shot people of color and shot them well with beautiful lighting that they haven't messed up the retouching because bad lighting, a photographer who doesn't know what they're doing with their equipment, they can wash people out. The contrast and brightness balance can be off. You want to look as good as humanly possible in your photos. So finding a photographer who understands how to shoot you, I think is important. And I guess kind of the third one, a lot of us are hung up on how we look, especially if we're normal people. See if they've shot normal people. I really tend not to here in Los Angeles go for photographers who clearly mostly shoot really gorgeous models and actors because I'm like what the heck are they gonna do with me so you too might want to look for photographers who shoot ordinary looking people but they make them look really really great that will hopefully make you feel more comfortable because honestly having your author photos taken it's really really awkward and slightly uncomfortable but also kind of exciting to be in the hands of a professional who might make you look really, really good. That's why I really want to get professional photos taken. So now on to a little bit on hair and makeup. As I said, especially if you're definitely going for a professional photographer, it is recommended that you do the hair and makeup services that are offered or you get them yourself. But you could do the semi DIY method I mentioned. You could go to Sephora and have them do your makeup. You could go and get a blow out so that like you did it DIY but you show up to the studio feeling confident but if you're really nervous honestly it's just easier to pay the money to get a professional to handle your hair and makeup but you can DIY hair and makeup. The tip there would be you definitely want your makeup to look fresh. That can mean applying it at the studio or doing it right before you go. Bring your things with you for touch up, especially anything that you can use to kind of blot and reset yourself. My tips for eye makeup, if you're confident enough to do it yourself, I have to say I probably would be confident enough to do my own makeup for a shoot, but I still might hire someone to do touch-ups. I think it's smartest to do kind of neutral-ish looks. That is what I went for today. I did something that was versatile that would go with multiple colors. So I did kind of golds and uh, purpley browns. I also used a cool toned eyeshadow palette, which are so hard to find by the way, because I am cool toned and I knew that that would be especially flattering. This particular eye look makes my eyes pop but it's not too outrageous that all you would see is my eye makeup. You guys have seen on occasion, I've done like weird pink vampire looks and I wouldn't do that for a professional shoot. I think it would be too distracting and it wouldn't go with enough things. If you're doing your own makeup, do a trial run. This is really, really important. Heck, do more than one. Do days where you do your entire face the way that you will do it on the day and then test it. Do you get especially shiny? Is that setting spray not working? That color combination you picked really didn't work. You need to use a setting spray. You need to use a primer. Test the look that you plan on doing before you do it. I also generally advise using higher end products, which again might be why it's good to pay for a makeup artist, meaning products that you know have really good pigmentation that are going to pop on camera, not in a bad way, that will last a long time. I'm wearing Pat McGrath. Now that I have bought Pat McGrath, I'm like, I can't live without it. And it just, it's totally my camera makeup now for something like this. I'm wearing a, I'm actually wearing something I'm not sure I would wear during a shoot. It was fine for this video. This is Charlotte Tilbury Hyaluronic Happy Kiss. So it is basically like a 
tinted balm rather than a lipstick. For an actual shoot, I will probably use my Ride or Die Charlotte Tilbury lipstick that I know is a little more neutral long wear and doesn't bleed around the edges. This requires some reapplication that's old, but I love the color. Uh, if you are gonna go down that route, just Again, do a test, make sure you haven't picked something that's gonna bleed around the edges or you're gonna have trouble Bring your lip pencils and your colors to do retouching as needed and be careful of your teeth. That's the other thing with a color like this. The, the balm doesn't really stick to my teeth, but if I were wearing a dark red lipstick, that would be a huge risk. Also, again, I mentioned makeup for camera. When in doubt, again, hire a makeup artist, but because you have all this beautiful, wonderful lighting, your features can disappear if you don't do at least a little bit of contouring. So if that is something you're comfortable with, I do recommend it, but be careful not to make yourself too orange. Hair is trickier. I am not a hair expert. Uh, th this, I styled this today. I don't know if this would be good enough for a, a photo shoot, and honestly, as I said, I'd probably get someone to do it for me, but it's good to have it freshly washed, recently colored, which my hair is not recently colored, so I probably wouldn't have a professional photo shoot right now. But don't be completely recently cut or colored. Don't schedule your author photo shoot or don't schedule your hair appointment if you are getting freshly cut and colored or doing it yourself. Uh, for one to two days before your shoot. Do it at least a week before you have a shoot that gives your hair time to calm down. Color is Color always needs a small adjustment period, but it'll still be fresh and shiny and you won't have roots. I will probably hire a professional because I know that they can make my hair look so much cuter than I can make it myself. But if you are DIYing, do a style that you know gives you confidence, that you know is flattering. And definitely be wary of things like flyaways. It doesn't mean shellac your hair onto your head, but there will be less for the photographer to touch up and for you to pay for if you don't have a million flyaways. But I'm sure there are better hair experts for photography. I will find some resources and link to them down below because really hair is not my area of expertise, though I do know how I like it. And I guess that's the important thing. Ultimately, that is the thing with your hair and your makeup. You have to feel it yourself or maybe a little outside yourself if you wanna feel a little bit glamorous. You need to feel happy and confident with your look. So actually, to that end, again, if you're picking a photography studio that provides the hair and makeup, look at their photos, make sure you like the hair and makeup because it's very likely you will get that person or one of those people. Or if you're hiring your own, look at the looks they do or even have them do a trial run. I'm pretty sure a makeup artist would be willing to do that. You want to make sure that what they do to your face feels natural. You don't, I did this whole eye look because I like making my eyes look like this, but this might be totally weird for you and you would never want to do this kind of glammy, glittery look. You would feel uncomfortable with a look like this and you would tell your makeup artist, you just want to look really natural and then they would do that for you. Wear the makeup and do your hair that makes you feel comfortable and confident. Same thing with your clothing. So what should you wear for your photos? The first thing is to avoid stripes and patterns. Anything that's going to look really busy. It doesn't mean no patterns, it means busy patterns. <laughs> but honestly, when in doubt, a solid color that is complementary to you and or the background, again, it can sometimes help to know where they take photos. Like, I don't think I would wear this in front of a red brick wall, but my green dress would really pop in front of a red brick wall. I mentioned that I, a lot of photographers will advise you don't wear white. It depends. White can look brilliant depending on where you are taking the photos. So you can ask the photographer what they plan on doing. If they are in a studio, and they're doing studio lighting or different backdrops, they can usually adjust those based on what you have decided to wear. If you do know the background, the smartest thing you can do is contrast to the background. Get to know the color wheel. So for example, this red dress would look amazing in front of a green wall of foliage because green and red are opposite each other on the color wheel. That's why I said that green dress would look great in front of a brick wall because they're opposite each other on the color wheel. If you are in a field of wheat, I'm making stuff up, wear purple because yellow and purple are opposite each other on the color wheel and so on. You don't always have to do that, obviously, but having some idea of color theory and how the colors of the clothes are going to go with the background can definitely help. It's actually funny that I chose green and red because I would say those are not common colors that you should necessarily use in a photo. They just happen to be colors that 
I like that I know are flattering in terms of my skin tone, cool toned, and my hair color and my eye color. My eyes are green. Uh, same reason I also like to wear blue and purple. Basically, know your colors and wear what makes you comfortable. I would never, ever, ever, ever wear yellow or orange, for example, because I don't like those colors and I don't look good in them. But you might be banging in those colors and those are the perfect colors to wear in your photo because you feel confident in them, they look great, they go with the background, and so on. Another little tip, this is harder, but if you know your cover color story, like if you've seen your cover and you still have time to turn in your photo for the book jacket, you can color coordinate to your jacket. So I knew that my jacket was white and red. So when I did my DIY shot, that is why I wore a red dress in the photo because I knew it would be a little matchy matchy on purpose. I kind of learned this lesson because unintentionally, because sometimes it just doesn't work out. I wore a green dress because I love wearing green and I was confident in it and my it clashed with my purple color so they actually made my author photo black and white for my first book. Which is fine, they can do that. But I think it's kind of fun if you bear in mind what your cover looks like. Same thing with genre. Some genres are gonna facilitate you being sunny and happy and smiley in your photos and others you might want to be a little more serious. There's a reason why for the Ivies I was a tiny bit more serious in my posing and my face. I love a wide smile, like that is personally my favorite thing to do in photos, but it just didn't feel right for my thriller photos so I didn't do it. So those are the kind of things that you can bear in mind. Another thing with clothing, I find it's best or better. Uh, make sure it's a newer piece of clothing. It doesn't mean you have to buy something new, but like don't wear something, even if you love it and you're comfortable in it, that has kind of, is kind of the worst for wear because you've worn it a lot. Maybe it's been laundered a bunch of times and it just doesn't look as fresh and as new. I find it's good to like get something and like you've worn it a couple times and you know you like it and you're comfortable in it and you know it's flattering but it looks kind of crisp and new in the photos. I personally think that is best though of course there are exceptions. You should also consider things like necklines, sleeves. So I personally don't wanna wear anything sleeveless in photos. I mean, we can talk about how self-conscious I am about my arms, but also I just think there's something structurally in a garment for an author photo, but having some kind of strong sleeve. So this happens to have these like peasanty sleeves and I'm not even 100% sure I would do an author photo in this because there's something with the crochet top. I don't know if texturally I like it, I don't know if it looks nice enough, but I liked their sleeves. The previous dress, the green dress, had this really nice like crisscross thing, and it was a retro style dress, which is a style of dress I really like. I feel confident in that. I think it flatters me. I think I like this square line as well. My favorite neckline is a sweetheart neckline. Know these things about clothes and about yourself, what you feel good in, what is flattering, and what how it's going to look on camera, especially because Okay, so I'm a little bit of a cheater. When I do my DIYs, I photograph myself from here up because I like that part of my body. The real wisdom with photos, you're actually usually supposed to be waist up and professional ph photographers will do that. Again, why I want a professional because it's like, ugh. Like being frank, and I know many ladies who have larger area here are gonna understand it. They're just, they Proportionally, they're a lot in a photo, so I like to go from here up, but that's another reason to make sure that the top of your garment, whatever you wear, whether it is a shirt or a dress, that it is how it's, you have to consider how it's gonna look on camera, visually, in terms of structure, uh, texture, pattern, again, because theoretically, best ideally, you are actually gonna be photographed from the waist up. If you're going with a professional photographer, they will consult on the clothes for the shoot. I think some of them might actually do it beforehand that you're able to send them photos or show them, or you can come to the shoot with a variety of options. Generally, that is advised. Come to the shoot with a variety of options, then you can have that conversation with the photographer and decide which outfits are best. And on that note, I'll do... Here is another example of a top that I would consider for a photo shoot because it's one I own. I like it. I, again, sleeves. I actually think it has quite interesting sleeves structurally. It's got this little tie thing. So my neck doesn't disappear, but it's a little, but it doesn't show all of this. 
matches the makeup that I chose. It's green, you know I love green. In this particular case, I have worn this in multiple videos. I like the way I look in this particular shirt. So again, being smart about choosing things that look good. This is also kind of a business casual type shirt. You definitely wanna consider the clothing that you're wearing and the kind of vibe that it gives off. But if you compare it to other parts of the video, note how the color I wear kind of completely changes the way that the frame looks. It kind of changes the lighting. I think I look a little bit cooler toned with this on versus the red. Ooh, just seeing that next to me. So definitely consider colors and what makes the most sense to wear on camera. So some final tips kind of related to color. I mentioned that my publisher made my headshot black and white. That is another thing to consider. Of course how your author photos are going to look in color, but also how they might look in black and white. And it might be worth doing at least one look that's very high contrast so it could be made black and white and everything will look nice and register properly in black and white. You don't wanna wear anything that's going to wash out where there won't be enough kind of like deep dark blacks contrasting with the mids and the highs. As I already mentioned, consider how your photo is going to crop and make sure that you have a variety, horizontal, vertical, ones that'll crop well as a square. And I mentioned, I mentioned the whole like where I don't do a big smile for my thrillers because it doesn't feel tonally appropriate. Definitely consider your genre, your category, what you're writing. You want to be maybe more smiley and approachable if you're writing for younger kids. That'll also potentially impact the wardrobe that you wear. It can also mean you can have a little bit more fun with setting and props. Like you, like posing in the children's section of a bookstore would make more sense if you're writing middle grade or picture books. But if you write like dark thrillers, maybe you're posing in the woods and you're looking a little dramatic and maybe you make that photo black and white. So you can have a little bit of fun with your author photo depending on genre. Though generally you can't go wrong with just wearing something nice, looking at the camera and giving a little smile. So that is an overall primer on author photos. The things that you might want to consider, general cost, DIY versus professional. As I said, my personal recommendation is whenever possible, if you can afford it and kind of work up the courage is to get professional headshots taken, to set aside a little budget, take a little bit of your book advance and budget it for getting nice author photos. Cause when they're good and they turn out well, that's an investment. You can use that photo for years and years and years and you know that you have an author photo that you feel happy with and confident about and because it's going to be sent out, it's going to be on your books. Anytime you do an event, they're going to use your photo and you're going to have to stare at your face. So it's good that you like your author photo. And the more professional your author photo looks, I do think it just, I think it helps your career, honestly. In many cases, it's the first impression that someone gets of you as an author. And I know that's kind of overwhelming. It's really kind of scary how much like this photo of your face matters. It's a reminder to us of like, well, all sorts of things in publishing, including pretty privilege about how like, oh, like it's about me, the author. Don't sweat it too much. Yes, it's important. Again, why I advise you hire a professional. You get that makeup and hair professional because their job is to make you look your best and you just have to suck it up once, at least once every couple of years, maybe, maybe more than that. Like maybe update your author photo every five to 10 years, depending on how you age. Like, it's just like, you just gotta suck it up and do it that one time and then you have that nice polished image. And the rest of the time, don't worry. You can sit on your couch, you don't have to wear pants, you don't have to do your makeup, up and you can kind of like be whatever but for that one author photo like I think it's worth kind of paying a professional hiring people who know what they're doing if you are not confident yourself what's so funny is after doing all this DIY my first author photo I barely knew how to do makeup so it's not that imp impressive but by the second one I actually felt really confident and that's kind of nice it does make DIY a little easier and I'm not shaming anyone who doesn't want to do a professional shoot or can't afford a professional shoot. DIY can't work. And I hope I gave you a ton of tips that help because I mean, I've done it more than once. Um, and it can turn out very, very nice. So let me know down below in the comments any questions you have about all of this stuff with author photos or if you are seasoned yourself. Tips, especially if you've done DIY, there are lots of different great tips that make DIY a little easier or getting your photo taken professionally. I'd love to hear more about that because as I said, it's something I really want to do and hopefully will do for my next author photo. 
though I am also a little nervous. I think I have a person picked out. I've narrowed it down to a few. In fairness, LA is a very intimidating market in which to get your photo taken when you are a normal human being. So that's, that, that's, that's an LA thing. But especially if you have any hacks for finding a good photographer to take author photos when you're not in the big city, that's most people. So that would be really, really helpful down below in the comments. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I'll make more videos about the ins and outs and how to's of being an author. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and happy writing.